on the origins of the coronavirus in Wuhan, China. <laughs> I mean, this stuff's crazy. This is the Biden administration. This is the deep state. And we are in a spiritual battle that's manifesting itself like never before. Don't go away. We're back with more after this. Today, moral relativism and political correctness are assaulting truth. How can the world have hope when believers themselves aren't clear on the authority of the Bible? The Church of Jesus Christ always faces a tremendous temptation to deviate from the Word of God. The God who speaks clearly expresses God's intent in giving us His Word and the response that is demanded of those who hear. Nobody ever encounters God and says, that was boring and irrelevant. When people say that about the Bible, it just says to me, they've not encountered the God of the Bible. Our faith is rooted in history, and, and consequently, we need to use the evidence and never be afraid of it. The God Who Speaks is a feature-length documentary from the American Family Association, which could bolster your confidence in the Word of God. The churches really need to see this, really need to understand what the Bible actually is. Available now at thegodwhospeaks.org. Here's a moment of hope for your home with Jerry and Becky Trace. Does God talk? Children can ask the strangest questions, often with deep thoughts. Listen to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. The Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. There are three important words in this one verse. Knowledge is information. Understanding is how information takes meaning. And wisdom is is the key to the proper use of information and understanding. Wisdom is given by God to the person who seeks Him. By wisdom, we can survive in this crazy world full of loud voices and violent people. Learn all you can, and then think about what you learn, but overall, ask for wisdom, the wisdom from God. Learn more about the ministry of Jerry and Becky Drace, including evangelism with integrity, devotions, articles, and more at hopeforthehome.org. Preborn celebrates that Roe vs. Wade has been overturned. Roe has been responsible for the slaughter of over 63 million babies. Now the decision to abort a child will be left in the hands of the states, and sadly, abortions will continue in the most liberal states. Over the past 16 years, Preborn has positioned their clinics in the top abortion cities where 50% of abortions occur. Preborn's work of saving babies' lives continues at an even greater level as they save babies' lives and defend their centers from the radical hate groups who want to shut them down. Preborn's response is dependent on you, the pro-life community. Be a part of rescuing lives and changing hearts for Christ. $28 sponsors one ultrasound and $140 will help to rescue five babies' lives. Dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby or go to preborn.com. All gifts are tax deductible. Welcome back. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday for Washington Watch. All right, this is a big week. We've got the Pray Vote Stand Summit coming up Friday and Saturday. Great lineup. We're going to have uh, former President Donald Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence, Governor Ron DeSantis. Uh, we're going to have uh, a host of other leaders, congressional leaders, as well as a number of religious leaders. Pastors. We're going to have Pastor Jack Hibbs, Gary Hamrick, and, uh, and others. So be sure and if you can, join us. There's still time and there's still room, but you're going you're gonna to have to register soon. Go to prayvotestand.org to find out more and to register. As I mentioned, according to House Coronavirus Subcommittee Chairman Brad Winstrup and House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner, a senior-level CIA officer with decades of experience testified to members of Congress that the CIA offered a monetary bribe to agents investigating the origins of COVID-19 to change their conclusion that the virus originated from a leak at the Wuhan lab. Now you'll recall that both the FBI and the Department of Energy uh, released their conclusions that the virus most likely originated from the Wuhan lab. So what was behind this? Why would the CIA want to cover up their own findings? What, what were they afraid of? Who were they trying to protect? 
What does this go back to? Joining me now to discuss this and more is Congressman Rich McCormick. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, as well as the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. He represents the 6th Congressional District of Georgia. Dr. McCormick, welcome back to the program. Great to see you. Thanks. Good to be with you. So what do we know about this potential CIA bribe and cover-up so far? Yeah, so what we've heard is some of it's not specific, but basically six out of the seven scientists originally stated that they thought that this was from a lab leak. And it makes sense as a scientist, as an ER doctor, not much else makes sense other than a lab leak. Then suddenly they changed their opinions based on essentially a bribe. Uh, they promised a bonus and they would uh, reconsider and say, no, we think this came from a natural uh, course, such as a bat or a dog or whatever you want to say it came from. Uh, the fact of the matter is it never made sense from the beginning because China put a considerable amount of effort into proving that it came from a natural source, which they could never prove. If it came from a natural reservoir, then it would have still existed. That's how viruses exist. They, they continue in the same species, but we've never been able to identify that whatsoever. So the only remaining natural theory that makes sense is from the lab leak. From a lab that, by the way, remember, said we were going to do it. Uh, we want to get funding for this uh, advancement uh, of technology so we can actually have gain of function. We said no. They did it anyways. Usually when you ask for that kind of funding, they've already started anyways. Right. It was embarrassing to our government. In my opinion, Fauci covered it up because he was embarrassed to put funding to begin with, even if it was with or without our uh, permission. Uh, why the CIA got involved with it, it would have to been some sort of direction from the president. Uh, otherwise, I don't know why they'd want to cover it up, quite frankly. And that's what we're going to get to the bottom of. It's the next step of of why there was such a government. Why would the CIA get involved in, in pushing their thumb down on the scales of justice and figuring out what actually happened? That's what's really worrying people all the way around. When the government comes in and they have an issue that, that has nothing to do with getting what's right and just, not finding the truth, but just playing politics, that always worries us. From the beginning of time, that the establishment of our country, we've had a deep mistrust of government, and especially when they do these sort of things, it just gets us more worried. Well, you, you, being on the subcommittee, the select sub, subcommittee on the coronavirus, you've heard a lot of testimony, look at a lot of documents. Is, is it a re, is it reasonable for to look at this and say, was the CIA possibly covering for China? It, it sure is troubling and to think that. I mean, why would uh, I, I think it's because we have been in, in coercion uh, unwittingly. I think it makes us look very uh, dull in our investment in the Wuhan lab. Uh, where they did something that literally cost multiple countries millions and millions of, cut, uh, of lives of their citizens because something that we're funding. Like I said, I don't think we wittingly went into this and said, we want you to do gain of function. We're authorizing that. But the fact is, we were funding it, whether we wanted to or not. And I think that's where the cover-up came. And as you know, most problems come from cover-ups, not honestly. Right. So what are the next steps for the subcommittee that's looking into this now that you have this information? Well, let's find out who got those bonuses. Identify those scientists, bring them in, make them testify so they actually have to have an honest conversation and enlighten us on who gave those bonuses, who offered it specifically. Let's weed out the CIA, let's weed out the FBI. Let's, let's make sure we call to the carpet those people who are doing things that are not just unjust, but dishonest and, and get an honest conversation. I think that's what the American public demands is that they have transparency of their government that their uh, government agencies aren't colluding with the enemy or covering up something that we can learn from because uh, we want better answers for the things that we've brought. It, it, but it's kind of like whack-a-mole. I mean, every time you turn around, there's another scandal over here. There's more information coming out over here. And, I, and in fact, you've been heavily focused on the chaos at the southern border, particularly as an entry point for known terrorists. You know, what is the what is the way forward here? What does the Biden administration need to do to address the crisis at our border? <laughs> the only thing the Biden administration can do to address the border is to get out. Because we need to replace him. He's not going to do it. He's, he already knows this is unpopular, even with his own party. You have sanctuary cities saying, enough, we can't handle it. Uh, when a sanctuary city says, we want to send him to the country, you know there's a big problem. When the cities that they have thought it was such a great idea that they had to deal with it. Also, the reality is that they don't have a place to keep them. Then when you have nothing but consumers, nobody producing something, when they're consuming, uh, whether it be food, shelter, uh, they're not working, they're not legally allowed to work. 
uh, stay in Mexico was the right thing to do. And now we're, we're literally having billion dollar grants with no bidding process, providing people at a very expensive rate, uh, more than you and I would go on a vacation with, uh, for very meager accommodations with no hope of staying here in the long term because they're not here legally. And the only way for them to stay here will be through uh, avoiding any court, sort of contact with the legal system because they're going to be deported if we follow the law. Right. And if we're not following the law, why are they here to begin with? I mean, that's part of the humanitarian crisis. Of course, we've got the children that have just been lost, the tens of thousands of children that have been lost. We've got the drugs coming over. We've got the terrorists coming over. It, and you're right. I, I was on the border during the Trump administration's policy of uh, remain in Mexico, and it looked like a ghost town. Uh, it was working back then. Congressman, we're out of time. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, great to see you. Appreciate your insight. My pleasure. God bless you. And Semper Fidelis. Semper Fi. Congressman McCormick of Georgia. All right. A major international religious freedom summit took place last week in Taiwan. Um, it's important. Important issue, religious freedom internationally. It's something that's been neglected under this administration. FRC's Ariel Del Zerco was there, spoke at the forum. She joins me next with a report on her trip to Taiwan. Don't go away. You know, it's true. Difficult times have a way of focusing us. We have to think about what matters most when it comes to our spending, our health care. This is why so many people are joining MediShare right now. MediShare is a trusted way to save up to 50% on your monthly health care costs. More than 400,000 people have already made the switch. It's pretty obvious why, too, especially now during this challenging season with health care costs and out-of-pocket expenses going up. MediShare can save you a lot of money. The typical family saves $500 a month. MediShare works, too. It's been around for 30 years. Members have shared more than $5 billion of each other's bills. There are different options to choose from to fit your budget. I'll give you the number here in a second. And if you call, you can get a price within two minutes. Maybe now is the perfect time to make the switch and start saving. Here you go. Call 833-44-BIBLE. That's 833-44-BIBLE. 833-44-BIBLE. I'm Rick Scarborough, and this is my take. On April 26, 1777, with almost two years of armed conflict already behind them, John Adams wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail, pointing out to future generations the cost his generation was paying for liberty. Quote, Posterity, you will never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you'll make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. End of quote. Friends, do we really understand the sacrifices of that first generation? Do you think they bled and died so our streets could be filled with transgender activists demanding your acceptance and drag queens dancing for our children in public places? It is time that decent people show up. I'm Rick Scarborough, and that's my take. You can get my new book at americainthebalance.us. This is Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. The website, TonyPerkins.com. As I mentioned earlier, coming up this weekend, the Pray Vote Stand Summit begins Friday morning. So just a couple of days away, but you still have time to, uh, to be a part of it. You can register. Online at prevotestand.org. We've got, uh, it's going to be a great weekend. Uh, Friday night, uh, we're going to hear from uh, former President Donald Trump. We're going to hear from Governor DeSantis. Uh, Mike Pence, Vivek, is going to be with us. Uh, Senator Josh Hawley. We'll have uh, several members of Congress that are going to be on various panels uh, informing you of what's going on. Dr. Ben Carson is going to be here. North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, who's really stirred things up in that state, taking on the education system. Uh, Missouri Attorney General Andrew uh, Attorney General Andrew Bailey, he's the one that's been on the program quite a bit. He's gone after the, successfully gone after the Biden administration on their censorship of free speech. Pastor Jack Hibbs, Gary Hamrick, Oz Guinness, uh, Riley Gaines, the swimmer, she's going to be with us. So anyway, uh, I had a lot more. Go to, go to prevotestand.org to get a full listing. 
and to register. Again, that's prayvotestand.org. Last week, the uh, Taiwan International Religious Freedom Forum took place in Taipei, where officials, dignitaries, lawmakers, and faith leaders from around the world gathered to confront and expose religious persecution throughout the world. Now, this was something that the United States was taking the lead on during the Trump administration, but uh, it's fallen to the wayside. You know, and you think about the locations for this meeting last week. I can't think of a better place to hold this forum than on the island of Taiwan under the shadow of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, as they are boldly standing for religious freedom and for freedom of, of all people. In fact, uh, uh, the uh, president of the parliament there gave me a, a, an award for being sanctioned by the Chinese. And I was unable to make it to Taiwan, but we sent uh, someone who was much more capable of dealing with the issue of international religious freedom, the director of our Center for Religious Liberty here at the Family Research Council, Ariel Del Turco. Ariel, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So if you fall asleep, I'll know it's Jeff. <laughs> Just that. Well, give us, a, uh, give us a quick interview of, number one, or an overview, the, the, the purpose of uh, the forum and, and the outcome. Yeah, well, the purpose was to gather uh, leaders on this issue and politicians who want to advance the cause of religious freedom. And it's such an important region because Asia is sadly a bit of a hotbed for persecution. You've got China, you've got North Korea, you've got Burma, uh, you've got other places that are really struggling and Christians and others who are struggling there. Uh, so it was gathered there. But you were exactly right. It was in a free country, the country of Taiwan, which has really taken up this issue of religious freedom, and they are eager to be champions on this. And it's a very unique setting uh, because it's in a Chinese-speaking country, very close to China, an island not very far away, and yet it's so very different, and it's really a model of uh, how countries can embrace religious freedom, can embrace political freedoms. Only 30 years ago, this country was under martial law, so it's really a model for the rest of Asia. How many different countries were represented there? Oh, dozens of countries across Asia and also across the world. We had representatives from Africa telling their story, talking about the persecution of Christians in Nigeria and elsewhere. Uh, we had representatives from North Korea, uh, from Europe. So. Ariel, uh, answer this question. You know, someone say, well, you know, I know your Family Resource Council, you're focused on policy in the United States, and I know you work on religious freedom because that obviously is important. Why, why would you go to, to, to Taiwan? Yeah, well, the United States actually has an outsized impact. What happens here matters, but also our foreign policy has a great impact around the world. And that's for good or bad. So as Christians who care about government, we need to be focused on making sure that our foreign policy is upholding godly values, upholding American values like religion.